all the way back to the way they were. They're, you know, they were 80% better when the patch was working. And then when it fails, they're not quite as bad as they were before. They're maybe 10% or 25% better. Um, if there is some degree of durable improvement, even if it's not as good as it was when the, the patch was newly placed and everything was much better, um, if there's some degree of durable improvement, I think that is a compelling argument to continue doing uh, non-directed um, continued blood patches the, uh, with the hope that as you continue to do them, you will continue to accrue further uh, benefit. I think that um, on the other hand, if you do not show any accrued benefit, then really what you don't want to do is keep doing something that isn't working and exposing yourself to the risk of another accidental dural puncture with an epidural patch because every so often we do that. And if you're not getting any accrued benefits, you, want, you don't want to keep doing that. You want to try and localize the leak better. And there's really uh, two ways to localize the leak better. One is you can look at that MR myelogram that quote unquote failed to localize the leak and ask yourself the question, not do I see a leak here, but what level of the spinal column doesn't look quite like the rest? Is there just a small little bone spur or disc that is pushing on the thecal sac somewhere? Um, anywhere where you can see the thecal sac kind of tented in um, and you try and target that uh, with directed patches and see if you can actually start to using your patches or your imaging localize where the leak is better. Often in that regard, it's useful to use fibrin glue as opposed to blood. Uh, blood patches, when you inject the blood, the blood takes a long time to clot, relatively speaking. And so, you know, something on the order of five to 10 minutes. And so you can inject through an epidural needle anywhere from uh, 10 to 15 to 20, and depending on the level, even 30 cc's of blood through an individual needle with the expectation that it's going to spread over a fairly wide area. And, um, and that's good because if you don't know where the leak is, you want to maybe spread blood over a wide area and, um, and cover lots of territory where the leak might be. Fibrin glue, on the other hand, turns to clot much more rapidly, something on the order of between 30 seconds and two minutes. And so you don't want to inject a large volume of it uh, for fear that it might kind of start to clot at the tip of the needle and just form a ball that then can push on the spinal cord or the fecal sac. And so you use lower volume when you use glue. We typically inject two or three cc's per level. And, um, and so if you're at the wrong level and you inject two or three cc's of glue, you don't see any effect. On the other hand, the glue really seals very nicely at least temporarily while it's there. It's a very strong and uh, more durable clot uh, when compared to kind of natural clot from your own blood. And so if you're able to selectively patch with glue uh, and find a place where the, uh, the leak symptoms go away temporarily, at least after glue is put in one spot, say T5, uh, but, but symptoms don't go away when you put glue at T9 or L4, that starts to be a more compelling argument that you've localized the leak. And then you have the option that uh, the leak may now be better treated because you're not just putting blood on it, but you're putting glue on it. And you're not putting the blood down at L2-3, hoping it'll get up to T5, but putting the glue right on T5 and therefore assuring that it's in fact getting on where the leak is. And so, um, so one strategy is to basically do this kind of selective targeting of patches with glue until you find the spot. That can require a lot of trial and error, knowing that when you put the glue in the wrong spot, you will get nothing. Um, what we have found very helpful for targeting these kinds of targeted fibrin patches uh, are CT myelograms, which just provide much better 
uh, ability to target than the MRIs in our hands. And uh, I think this is really for three reasons. One is um, it's much easier to see a little contrast leaking out of a myelogram than to see water tracing along a nerve root on an MRI. Uh, two is CTs are exquisitely sensitive to teeny tiny little bone spurs that push on the fecal sac and can lacerate the, the, the dura as compared to an MRI, which is um, on which calcifications are not so visible. And three is the um, increased spatial resolution. So with our CT myelograms, we're spacing them uh, 0.625 millimeters apart, as opposed to typically on an MRI, it's more than two, uh, two millimeters apart. And so with an MRI, you often will jump over the area that you're interested in. And with a CT myelogram, you'll often catch a small something that's missed on a uh, MR myelogram. And so we find the CT myelograms much more helpful for targeting and, and allowing us to pick out, okay, we're gonna put some glue here, we're gonna put some glue there and, um, and see if you get something. It should be noted at this point that um, both at Duke and at Cedars, uh, in this situation where um, somebody is responding to patches, um, they would be doing kind of different varieties of CT myelograms. So an MR myelogram failed to show symptoms. At Cedars at this point, they are um, doing lateral decubitus uh, uh, digital subtraction myelograms and have found that while until last year, um, the thought was that CSF venous fistulas accounted for only maybe 2% of people with postural headaches who had totally normal spinal imaging. Uh, when you do these kinds of digital subtraction myelograms in the, with people on their sides, um, instead of finding only a 2% incidence of CSF venous fistulas, now they're finding you know, upwards of 30%, uh, suggesting that it's really an imaging problem. Um, and that was work that was published by Dr. Shevink and a Canadian, Dr. Farb. Uh, to, uh, to re which I think is a real advancement in the field. Um, and one way that you can take that next step when uh, an MR myelogram fails to localize the leak. At Duke, they're doing things a little bit different with, um, but essentially using variants of CT myelograms to again, better localize uh, where the leaks are and to, to um, to do kind of hyperdense CT myelograms where they're looking at particular segments, looking for hyperdense veins on their CT myelograms to, to better localize the leaks. So, you know, there's additional invasive imaging and then there's selective patching. And those are really your options. Um, so I think that's kind of your next step. The next step would be at Stanford, a CT myelogram and, uh, trying to do selective patches, looking to see if we can find a place where you put glue and have your symptoms get temporarily better, which would either lead to more durable symptom improvement with the patches or be able to tell a surgeon, hey, look, I put glue here and they get better when I put glue there and there, it doesn't go operate here. We're having some success with that. Uh, next question. Thank you, Dr. Carroll. Uh, we're being joined by a number of additional viewers on Facebook Live, and I want to I want to welcome those viewers to our live stream Q and A session. Uh, if you're just joining us, we're with Dr. Ian Carroll, and as I said, this is a Q and A session brought to you by the Spinal CSF League Organization of Canada. So, thanks thanks again for those joining on Facebook. Uh, Dr. Carroll, question number two comes from Sophie. Her question is: What do you do for leakers who previously responded to patching? but for whom invasive imaging has higher risks? And there's kind of a second part to the question, which is, and are there, is any headway or progress being made, made with respect to imaging that is less invasive? Um, so um, what do we do for leakers in whom invasive imaging has higher risks? Well, the uh, you can still do the selective patching, uh, injecting glue selectively at smaller 
uh, levels, um, where it's, uh, excuse me, kind of selective targets uh, based on the MR imaging, which is somewhat less useful in our hands for doing that than CT myelogram, but it's a way forward instead of being stuck. Um, and the, uh, with regard to better non-invasive imaging, the real advances we've seen over the last couple of years have really all been in invasive imaging. We, we, are in, we have a manuscript that's out there being reviewed that involved um, looking at PET MRI, where we uh, have a combined IV PET ligand, which is kind of a radioactive uh, glucose um, substrate, where we think we're seeing some evidence that uh, that where the CSF is leaking out, the tissue is somewhat metabolically more active, but that was, that's a really small case series. And um, we're working on this, that that, would, that that imaging does not require an intrathecal injection or anything injected into the, uh, into the spinal fluid. So it combines that kind of PET study with an MRI. And again, really early days in that only, I think we only have six or eight patients who've had that done. And, um, but we're hopeful that could turn into something. The, uh, but that's really where you are at this point. I think for most people, um, what you're doing, if you can't get a CT myelogram or a radionuclide cisternogram or a digital subtraction myelogram is, you look at that MRI and you say, which of these levels doesn't look like the rest? And you start putting um, glue on those selectively. And what I think looks kind of suspicious is probably pretty different than kind of your local radiologist only because we've had the opportunity now over the last four or five years as the people at Duke and Cedars have as well to look at the imaging, go patch somewhere, see it not work, go back, patch another place, see it not work, go back, patch another place and see somebody get remarkably better and say, oh, you know, this is what that looked like on the imaging. You know, it didn't look like that much, but it looked like this. And so the next time you see that, you're more tuned into it. And so that's, I think, one of the places where going to a, a referral center is, is helpful, but, you know, the whole world can't go to every referral center, unfortunately, yet. Um, next question. Thank you again. This is a question from Zara. Do you recommend a blood patch for a patient with EDS due to risk of complications? So if you have EDS and you have a CSF leak, for sure, we recommend a blood patch. Um, the, uh, uh, the dura is uh, thinner and perhaps more attenuated and more subject to chronic leaking in people who have hereditary disorders of connective tissue, including EDS and other hereditary disorders of connective tissue. But um, you can't let somebody just leak without treating them. I think that's that, that would fall into the cruel and unusual punishment category as far as I'm concerned. And um, alternatively, surgery is not like a great option for a great many people. Our experience at Stanford and the published experience at Cedars suggests that up to 50% of people who have surgery fail, either immediately or um, in delayed fashion. And so, you know, that is a, that is a really tough thing to deal with. And um, so I think we have moved to a point where we don't really move to surgery until we become thoroughly convinced we ain't going to get there in terms of improvement without doing surgery. We really, um, we really try to exhaust all other options because it's much harder to do any patching in the area of the leak when surgery has been done in that area. There's fibrosis and scarring in the epidural space. It becomes much harder to get spread in that epidural space and more hazardous trying to put a needle in there without putting a new hole in the dura. So um, those people with EDS are the ones that we're, we're often most willing to patch because they have a good known predisposing factor for a leak and um, doing surgery on them is often uh, associated with, with increased risk. Although um, Dr. Shevink did a study uh, a good while back where he looked at these patients with hereditary disorders of connective tissue and found that in fact, 
um, while people with leaks were more likely to have the stigmata of hereditary disorders of connective tissue and EDS, those patients did not do worse at surgery. And there is no clear evidence that is parallel with patching that suggests that they do worse with patching than people who don't have EDS. Um, next question. Okay, so this is, I'm, I'm going to jump to a question from Karen further to your point about surgery, Dr. Carroll. Okay. What are uh, options or recommendations for patients uh, for whom surgery or an attempt at repairing a leak through surgery was not successful? So what to do for patients who have surgery and the surgery fails? Yeah. Um, well, we try to do that, which is difficult, which is we try to patch them again, um, only because we have some hope that maybe the surgery has made. So first of all, I guess we should step back and say, um, assume someone doesn't go to surgery until they failed multiple patches and we've become convinced that they're not gonna be fixed with an epidural patch. Then they have surgery, maybe they're better for six weeks and their symptoms come back. Um, we would try to patch that person again, only because we have some hope that the anatomy of the defect has been changed by what the surgeon has gone in there and done. And so while we had proven to ourselves that they couldn't be fixed with a patch before surgery, the anatomy is different after surgery and we haven't proved that to ourselves afterwards. And so we do try to patch them again. Um, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. We've had at least one patient who had a big bone spur um, that was pushing on her fecal sac from a calcified disc at T4-5 who went and had surgery, was better for six weeks, symptoms recurred. She was despondent when, um, when her symptoms, when she had had surgery for the calcified disc, she had woken up with a, a leg that was weak for several weeks, but then resolved, but it had put the fear of paralysis into her. Um, and when she was offered a subsequent surgery, and was quoted a, I think a 10% chance of more permanent leg weakness, she declined. We wound up patching her repeatedly at the site of the bone spur at T4-5 and, and wound up finding after surgery what we didn't find before surgery, which is each time we did it, she'd get better for six weeks and then her symptoms would come back, but they did not come back as bad as they had been before. They came back with kind of a 20 or 30% durable improvement. And after six, or seven patches after surgery, she's now been essentially symptom-free for, I think, 18 or 24 months. I mean, like really, she's on the road. And um, so we do offer that and we look to see if patients will show us evidence that they can have a durable response. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Um, and uh, sometimes a surgeon's willing to go in there again, but often not. And not for, you know, not for irresponsible reasons. I think, you know, it's, it's surgery. Once you've gone into an area and all of the tissues are scarred down to another, one another, much harder a second time and much less likely to work statistically a second time than a first time. And so I think surgeons are appropriately wary of going in and potentially making a bad situation worse. So... Uh, I think that addresses that question. Other questions? Yeah, thank you. Uh, another treatment related question. This is from Leanne. Can fibrin glue be used where the leak site hasn't been imaged, but where high volume patches have worked temporarily? So we do that when we, when people have had high volume blood patches and they've worked temporarily, uh, but the symptoms keep coming back and we're not quite sure where the leak is, we will, we will totally, in fact, on an everyday basis, we see patients like that where we go ahead and we inject fibrin glue at, um, at target levels, trying to figure out exactly where, um, where the leak is and where we need to put glue to make their symptoms go away more durably. And in fact, as I look at the people who have um, joined us today, I can see at least one, two, three, uh, four, at least four people in whom that approach yielded a distinct answer about where their leak was, um, where we were able to identify when we put glue in this location, their symptoms go away for weeks to months. And 
and we could not get that information with uh, high volume blood patching. And um, so, you know, we do that all the time. Other questions? Yes, this is a question from Jolene that's just come to us in real time. I would like to know under what circumstances is it helpful to have a DSM performed to assist with locating a spinal uh, CSF uh, leak? Okay, so uh, that depends on who you ask. Right now, there is evidence to support and you can make a compelling case for doing a DSM to figure out if somebody has a visible and potentially surger, surgically targetable lesion under the following circumstance. So the, the, the broadly accepted circumstance is that published by Dr. Farb and Dr. Shevink last year, which is you have evidence on your brain MRI of intracranial hypotension, classic evidence, pachymeningeal enhancement, and sagging of the brain. So your brain shows clear evidence that you don't have enough spinal fluid, um, but your spinal imaging on conventional spinal imaging, meaning a regular MRI and a regular CT myelogram is negative. So when you have those two circumstances met, there is now evidence that would support you should get a digital subtraction myelogram because you will find a CSF venous fistula and something greater than 30% of those people who meet that criteria. Now, um, the question then becomes, what if you meet the second of those criteria, which is your spinal imaging is normal, conventional spinal imaging, MRI and CT myelogram, but your brain doesn't show that same pachymeningeal enhancement. Well, you would predict that you would find um, some CSF venous fistulas if you believe that brain imaging misses a substantial portion of people with leaks. That is something that I believe, but that many people do not believe. When you go and you look at the evidence for how sensitive a brain MRI is for detecting CSF leaks, what you find are probably four different studies done over the last 10 to 15 years in which major referral centers have looked back at their own cases and said, of the people who we diagnosed with a CSF leak, what percentage of them had positive brain MRIs? And they then report numbers ranging from 80 to 90%. But of course, they, um, they didn't diagnose people with a CSF leak unless some component of their imaging was positive. So for the most part, with the small exception of some number that get diagnosed with a CSF leak just based on opening pressure, which we know misses many, many leaks. So um, if you in fact only diagnose people with a leak based on positive imaging, and then you go back and count the numbers who have positive brain imaging, you will by definition, because your reasoning is circular, come up with a high number of positive brain imaging. And the people who have published those studies have been very careful not to say that that means that, so for instance, um, at Duke, they published on a, a series of patients that was over a hundred patients and counted up the number of people who had positive brain imaging and came up with something around 91%. And they were very careful not to say that that means that brain imaging captures 91% of CSF leaks. Um, Instead, they talk about it as the, the prevalence of positive imaging in their cohort, but their cohort was diagnosed with a leak in part based on imaging. So we don't really know what percentage of people um, had leaks, but weren't diagnosed with leaks because their imaging was negative. And we don't know what percentage never got to be assessed at Stanford or Cedars or at Duke because their imaging was stone cold normal. Right, All of those people don't ever make it into that assessment of uh, what percentage of CSF leaks are detected by brain MRI. So the long and the short is, is because in our data uh, and our experience, we don't see imaging predicting who's gonna get better from a patch. And in fact, 
Um, in existing studies, there's not a great correlation between positive spine imaging and positive brain imaging. Um, for those reasons, and including at least one study out of Japan that looked at patients, let me describe the study from Japan. There's a study that came out of Japan with about 250 patients with orthostatic headaches. They all got radionuclide cisternograms. Something on the order of 150 had positive radionuclide cisternograms. So maybe a little more than half of the patients out of 250 had positive evidence of a CSF leak on their radionuclide cisternogram. Of those, uh, 20 patients had evidence of brain sag and only one out of 150 had pachymeningeal enhancement. Now, the critics would look at that and say, um, well, radionuclide cisternograms may have a lot of false positives because of the dural puncture that you make. And you can argue back and forth on that. But the long and the short is, is what you can really rely on is that only one in 250 patients with orthostatic headaches had positive pachymeningeal enhancements and would, would have been diagnosed at Stanford or other centers as having a leak when 150 had evidence on another imaging modality of having a leak. So I think that there's reason to be, at least be skeptical that brain MRI is sensitive. I personally think that it misses a lot of people and my colleagues at Cedars and Duke also have significant doubts um, about what the sensitivity is, but we all guess different numbers. Um, and so we don't know, and it becomes hard to make a compelling argument, bringing it back to this. How do you argue for doing a digital subtraction myelogram in patients who don't have that brain MRI evidence? Because uh, Dr. Farb and Dr. Shevink, while they've documented how common it is to find CSF venous fistulas in those patients with positive brain imaging, they haven't looked at patients with clinical symptoms and negative brain imaging. They're just not there yet. So it's hard to, hard to, con hard to make a strong argument that that kind of invasive study in a limited resource environment um, should be done. Other questions? Yeah, thanks, Dr. Carroll. Um, we have one here from the Facebook Live um, portion from Julie. What is the likelihood of recurrence in a patient with a connective tissue disorder over time, having had multiple patches? Can the patient ever resume, quote unquote, normal activities? Uh, or is lifestyle not a contributing factor? Well, so I guess a couple of different questions there. Question number one is uh, really, what's the natural history of a CSF leak? Um, and what is the kind of hazard rate per year of, or per month or per day of having a leak recur when it's been fixed either by a patch or by uh, by uh, surgery? And the answer is we don't really know. There's not good data on this. Um, it's clear that many people recur and it's clear that some people do not. And we don't know uh, what really distinguishes those people. We've seen people with bone spurs that clearly pierce the dura and we were sh you know, very highly suspecting they would need to be surgically removed and we've patched them and they haven't recurred. I don't know why. Um, Dr. Shevink has told me that he speculates that if you patch them early, if you catch that kind of thing shortly after the first leak develops, that maybe you have a higher rate of success with the patching as compared to surgery. And I suspect he, he's right, but, I, but we don't have any data on that. We don't know the likelihood of, that any good given leak is going to recur over the next year. What I tell my patients is if you're lucky enough to be fixed by a patch, and that patch has caused your symptoms to resolve, it is to my mind prudent that you stop doing in a long-term way those things which have been proven to be precipitating factors among people who first develop a CSF leak. And so Dr. Louie and Dr. Sheving published a paper over 10 years ago looking at a series of about 90 patients who had developed spontaneous CSF leaks uh, two thirds of them could identify no precipitating factor, but one third could. And of the third that could, the things that they identified were, were usually not trauma. The things they identified as precipitating factors fell into a couple of categories. One was 
what we call in medicine a Balsalva maneuver, generating intra-abdominal pressure. So that, that thing that you do when you push in your abdomen, when you're constipated, um, that is not altogether different from the intra-abdominal pressure you generate when you vomit, um, that people can generate when they're trying to lift something heavy, uh, that, that kind of holding your breath and pushing seems to be a significant trigger for uh, causing a leak for susceptible people. Uh, another group of people develop their leaks when they bend over to lift up something heavy. And another group of people seem to develop their leaks when they um, are stretching. So yoga, Pilates, stretching is a recurrent thing. Um, and then there's a handful of people uh, who develop leaks uh, when they experience G-forces. So there's a couple of papers out there um, about roller coasters involved in people developing their leaks. And I believe there's at least one person on our, our screen today who, uh, who had a roller coaster involved in her leak. So I don't let my daughter ride roller coasters anymore. And I don't uh, actually let my daughter even uh, swing on a swing set anymore. Uh, just because like, you know, a leak is so bad. What are you going to, you're going to, you're going to let somebody experience G-forces for, you know, five minutes at the risk of creating a chronic problem again. I think if you've had a leak, um, I think helping your neighbor move their sofa is out of your life forever. I think uh, if you've had a leak, roller coasters are out of your life forever. I think it's prudent if you've had a leak to give up water skiing and skiing. Um, and uh, I think you, you make some lifestyle changes in the same way that someone with diabetes has to change their life. And it's a hard thing to do, but I think it's better than, than having your leak come back. And so I tend to be, I tend to urge people to be cautious, but there are some patients, like they feel like if they can't surf, like their life has no meaning and, you know, I think sometimes that's an easier decision to make about giving up surfing or skiing when you've seen it make your leak come back at least once. And then you can say, okay, you know, I just can't do this anymore. Um, so it's hard to tell a patient not to do those things, but those are the things I worry about. Like I've got one patient who sends me a, a Christmas card every year with her riding motorcycles with her boyfriend and now husband. And I'm like, I'm, I'm like appalled. I'm like, great. I really love the fact that she's healthy enough to do it, but like I can, you know, I just, every time I see it, I, I fear for her. Um, other questions, other thoughts? Thanks, Dr. Carroll. I realize we're taking uh, some valuable time. Do you have time for a couple more quick questions? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, this one's from Marie and we're kind of swinging the pendulum the other way now with uh, hypertension questions. Mm -hmm. What type of imaging do you recommend for people suffering from rebound intracranial hypertension and that have been suffering for a long time from that condition? So uh, patients who have long-term leaks and get patched can develop kind of this opposite problem of having too much pressure inside their head, what we call rebound intracranial hypertension. Um, most commonly, when we see people who have this, we don't get any additional imaging. And we usually don't get any additional imaging because it doesn't make us do anything different. Uh, when we have a question about, is it really high pressure or is it low? low pressure will sometimes get imaging. Um, we expect in low pressure for the veins to be a little distended and the pituitary to be a little big. And, and in high pressure, we expect the, the veins to be somewhat smaller and the pituitary to be less, uh, less robust. Um, but uh, often it doesn't help that much. Shivank has published something that Basically, uh, if you do an, what's called an MR venogram before patients are patched, that there are changes in the veins in the head that can predict who's going to develop rebound high pressure to some extent. Um, and sometimes we do those MR venograms afterwards looking for uh, evidence that there is venous obstruction that you might potentially treat by doing a venous, uh, a venous stent we haven't explored that that much. And um, I have yet to have a patient who I sent and who had a, um, a stent put in a vein to treat rebound high pressure. Uh, we've had some patients who've had shunts put in and um, 
I don't know that I have a clear vision yet on whether placing a shunt for rebound high pressure is really a successful mode of therapy. What's clear is in patients with pseudotumor, where they have elevated intracranial pressure um, without having had a leak, that putting in shunts really doesn't resolve head pain very well. Um, but that hasn't been evaluated in people with rebound high pressure. And so nobody really knows if you have rebound high pressure and you don't respond to diamox or amiloride or hydrochlorothiazide or methazolamide, whether you should be shunted early, late, or never. Um, we've resorted to shunting in some patients who have documented high pressure, who can't tolerate the diuretics without starting to show signs of kidney failure. And um, again, I don't think we have enough experience yet that we could provide clear guidance on that. Other questions? Uh, yeah, a question from uh, Morgan again in real time. Uh, it's, it, it seems to be a two-part question. So how often do seizures occur after a blood patch? And secondly, how often do you see a patient without an, without an orthostatic headache, but other symptoms? Um, so the first question is how often do seizures happen after a patch? Well, clearly not very often. I'm trying to think, I don't know that I've had a patient who after hatching has had a seizure. Um, I've seen patients with leaks have seizures. I don't know that I've seen somebody develop new seizures after patching. So I don't think it's very common. It's, I would be more likely to attribute it to the underlying leak than the patch per se. And I do worry when I do a patch, you know, sometimes people are leaking, but whatever, wherever the, the dura is kind of leaking from, it may not, you know, there may be kind of little teeny kind of friable type scar tissue over the leak that's not quite watertight, but is kind of holding back the dam burst. And that if you inject blood or glue around there, you can disrupt whatever teeny little kind of friable tissue might be partially covering the, uh, the area. And it is possible, I think, with a, a patch done without you actually causing a puncture, for just the, the blood or glue you inject to alter the anatomy enough to make somebody's underlying symptoms worse. I think that happens. Um, and so I wouldn't be surprised and I won't be surprised when eventually I see someone who does start having seizures afterwards who didn't before, uh, but I have not yet seen somebody have seizures um, after doing patches. And at this point we've patched, I think upwards of a thousand people or at least a thousand patches. And um, the other part of the question, what was the second half of the question? It was really a separate question. Yeah, I'm just, uh, I'm just placing myself here, apologies. Mm -hmm. All right, how often do you see a patient without an orthostatic headache, but other symptoms? Oh, uh, well, that's an excellent question. So people with CSF leaks, the classic person has orthostatic headaches, neck pain, ringing in the ears, nausea, vomiting, uh, fatigue, and uh, cognitive issues. The question is, and they always have those different symptoms to varying degrees. The question is how many of them, um, how often does a leak occur without the postural headache? And that can mean either no headache or it can mean a headache that is not obviously postural. So there are very clearly documented reports of people without headache who had clear evidence on imaging done for other reasons that they had a spinal fluid leak. Uh, so there are well-documented cases of people having pachymeningeal enhancement on brain MRI um, from CSF leaks who had absolutely no complaints of headache. That's been well-documented. But since nobody ever goes looking for leaks with that kind of date imaging in people who don't have postural headaches and because we don't know if in fact brain imaging misses most people with leaks anyhow, we don't know really what percentage of people with leaks don't have postural headaches, either don't have headaches at all or whose headaches are not postural. Uh, at this point, we require people coming to Stanford to do something called a 48 hour flat test, which is just a way of documenting symptoms, including head pain and how they respond to prolonged flatness. 
because um, it's clear that some people have to be flat a long time before their head feels better, sometimes more than 24 hours. And so some patients who used to tell us they didn't have postural head pain, after doing the 48-hour flat test, they discover that, in fact, their head pain really is postural. They just have to be flat longer to feel better. Um, and so, you know, some of whether you, you, some of whether you have a postural headache really comes down to how you define postural headache. Do you define it as head pain that's better within 30 minutes of lying down? Or um, do you define it as head pain that improves with prolonged flatness and how long you've been flat and how carefully have you looked at that? And does it have to go totally away or get 50% better or 30% better? All these things that are not well-defined. But they, the, the, I guess the more quick answer is yes, you can have, you can, you can not have a postural headache and have a CSF leak. The, uh, we are starting to get towards the end of our time, and our organizers asked that we do limit um, our uh, our our running over time. And so, um, I think with that, was there. Was there any other other questions that the organizers wanted us to cover before breaking off? Yeah, I just on a kind of concluding point. Do you have uh, yourself, you, you mentioned Dr. Shearing, this is a question from Terry, but any upcoming research regarding uh, SIH and rebound issues? Um, we do not have any current plans uh, to specifically study interventions in rebound. So we've talked about it, we've thought about it, but we haven't actually putting together a clinical trial, which is I think what's called for at this point. Um, it takes a lot of work and, it and you need a lot of patience with it. Um, and uh, we just haven't gone there yet. Probably maybe the first step would be documenting the extent to which it happens. Actually, probably the first step you guys might even be interested in this, is creating a registry of patients who believe they have it so that we could document what is the constellation of symptoms and start to track them over time so that we could say, what is the natural history of it? Um, I've seen people who have rebound for at least a couple of years. I've been surprised to see that some of my patients who had really refractory symptoms for you know, 18 months then get better after 18 months. So I'm not convinced that if you have it for a year, it means you're not going to get better. Um, but it's clear to me that it can in fact be a long-term problem. I have at least one patient who was so unhappy with the rebound high pressure that she was uh, unhappy that she had been patched for her leak in the first place. She felt that the, the leak was less disabling to her than the rebound. Um, and uh, so, um, but the answer is no, we don't have any current plans right now to do trials of what's the best way to manage rebound. Gary referenced, S referenced SIH as well. Any, anything? Oh yeah, I mean, for me, the big question in SIH and what I would really like to be able to contribute is a study that documents um, what are the factors that actually predict somebody responding to an epidural blood patch beyond imaging. And, um, uh, among patients who are symptomatic are patches. Among patients who are symptomatic but imaging negative, what percentage get better with patching? Because I think if you can show that even 20% of patients with orthostatic headache who are imaging negative get better with patching, that opens up patching and, and treatment to CSF leaks to a whole group of patients who right now are getting nothing. So remember that study I talked about out of Japan, out of 250 patients with orthostatic headache, only one had pachymeningeal enhancement. Now, maybe 100 of them didn't have leaks. Maybe 200 of them didn't have leaks. But if 200 of them didn't have leaks, that still leaves 50 patients who had leaks, only one of which had pachymeningeal enhancement. And the other 49 should be getting offered treatment, and they're not. So the real question is, you know, if you, if you look at people who have orthostatic headaches and you offer them targeted epidural patching, what percentage get better? Our data suggests it's a lot, but we gotta, we have to, you know, people look at that and they say, well, that's retrospective data. You cherry pick those patients, that's placebo effect. They're just responding to the 
to the fact that you brought them in the OR and made a big hubba baloo about looking with the C arm and blah, blah, blah. To which my response is, why did they have a placebo response when I patched them at T4, but not at T11, right? I don't understand that. Um, so I don't think it's a placebo response, but the way you formally prove that is you compare it to a placebo intervention. You bring them to the OR and you offer them a real patch or a sham patch and you blind them to it. You blind whoever assesses them for improvement to it. And, uh, and that becomes convincing to the skeptics. And that's the kind of study you can use to change health policy in the United States, what's covered in the United States by insurance companies and what services are offered by Canadian health authorities as well. So that's that's where I'm I'm going, and we're hoping that when we have that, um, the study will have to cover the cost of doing both the real and sham patches. And so, when that's happening, um, there's no compelling reason to me, except for travel expense, why patients could not be readily referred from Canada for that kind of thing, because we would be covering the cost of the patching. Um, we're not asking for Canadian insurance to cover it. And so it might be a way for uh, selected patients from Canada to be able to access that, at least ones that were willing to accept that there was a 50% chance they were gonna be randomized to sham patching. And with a study like that, usually you, um, at the end of the study, if you find in fact that, that patching was better than sham patching, you then offer open label uh, patching to the people who got sham which is to say you offer them the real thing, but you might not offer them the real thing if in fact you found that the real thing was no better than a fake thing, right? So. Well, yeah. well thank you very much for yeah. uh, considering Canadians and those future plans. And yeah. above all, thank you very much for, uh, for your time today, for your insights. These kinds of talks, particularly when we're you know, dealing with a world-renowned expert are really uplifting for patients. And uh, on behalf of the Canadian organization, again, very grateful and, and thank you very much for your involvement with us. All right. Well, it's a pleasure to be with you. And it's, I have to say that, you know, it has not lost on me as I look at the people who've joined us. I can see multiple people leaning back against their pillows, against their chairs. Um, I know what that means. And when I know, I know what it means in terms of uh, what you're experiencing, what your families are experiencing. Um, I get the whole thing that comes with that. And uh, I'm doing what I can. In fact, I feel guilty whenever I do something like play a video game, like I could be doing more, could do more to, to get the research moving or, so um, we, you know, and when I say we, I mean um, the community of people who have started to really identify each other as treaters, whether it's us at Stanford, or the group at Cedars or the group at Duke and the growing alliances between uh, us and also the group at Mayo and the group at Johns Hopkins and even international experts like Jurgen Beck um, in Germany. Uh, we are starting to coalesce around these problems and the goals for trying to help you in a way that did not exist 10 years ago. So there's reason to be hopeful. Don't give up. Okay. Thank you again. And thank you for all those in attendance. All right. Bye guys. Bye-bye.